Hi, AP Stats. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Um, we are moving on to chapter two in the practice of statistics. We're using edition four. Um, if you, uh, whatever, never mind. Ignore that thought. Anyways, so chapter one, chapter two, section one, day one. Um, and basically today what, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, how do you figure out where um, an individual value falls um, within a distribution. So like the location of a point on a distribution, like how do you describe that? Um, and we're going to use two things today. Um, the first is percentiles to locate an individual value. Um, we're going to go over what a cumulative relative frequency graph is. Um, they're not used too often, but you kind of need to have an idea of what they are. Um, and then the standardized, we're going to talk about the standardized value of an observation, uh, which is called, which is in stats known as the z-score, um, and interpret z-scores in context. So, uh, we're going to start with the percentile. So hopefully you have heard of the term percentile, right? You could maybe, um, you've had that term used in reference to, like, your height. Um, you go to the doctor and you get a physical and they say, hey, you're in the 80th percentile for height for people your age. Um, and basically what that means is you are taller than 80% of, you know, whoever their, whatever their population is um, within that age group. Um, so you're pretty tall. Um, if you're in the 10th percentile for weight, that means you're very, very skinny um, compared to other people like you. Um, if you're in the 20th percentile for ACT scores, that's a little rough because only 20% of people who have taken the ACT have done worse than you, um, which means 80% of people did better than you. So that's kind of rough. Hopefully you're not in the 20th percentile. Um, anyway, so hopefully you've heard that term used before. Um, and it's basically like at that value, you have a percent of observations that are below that value or worse than that value. Um, if you're racing and you're doing like, uh, you know, you're looking at times, um, if you are in the 80th percentile for times, you're actually going to have a lower time than other people because um, having a low time is a good thing in racing. So you just want to like be careful about the context of the problem, but basically, percentile gives you the percent of people who have done, who are worse or lower than that particular score or th than you, if we're talking about your percentile. Okay, so a couple of, like either common questions or common misconceptions um, is that one, the percent correct on a test does not equal your percentile. Like hopefully if you understand the idea of a percentile, you would under understand this, right? Um, Number two is that percentiles should be whole numbers. So you would not say, oh, I was in the 97.5th percentile. Um, you don't do that. You would give a whole number. Uh, the 95th percentile, the 96th percentile, uh, whatever is appropriate for that particular case. Um, oftentimes I get the question, like, do you use values less than? the observation or less than or equal to the observation um, when you're finding percentiles. And honestly, it actually doesn't matter as long as you're consistent and you understand what your numbers mean. Um, so for example, if you used values less than or equal to your observation, if you got the highest score in the class, you would be in the hundredth percentile. As opposed to if you were, if you had the lowest score, in that case, you'd actually be in like maybe the 10th percentile, even though there's nobody below you. Um, and if you did it the other way, where you're only using values less than the observation, then if you were in the top of the class, the, the, you had the highest score, you wouldn't actually be in the 100th percentile. You'd be in the 95th or 98th percentile, depending on how many kids are in the class. But if you have the lowest score, you'd be at the 0th percentile. So um, it just kind of depends on the situation. Uh, and Typically, when we use percentiles, there's so many observations that that 
little difference doesn't really matter um, and you'd end up getting the same answer regardless um, so that one don't doesn't really matter okay um, and last but not least um, two of the same values should be at the same percentile so if you and your friend get an 85 then you should both be at the same percentile um, because one of you is not above the other right you're at the same same percentile okay next is the ogive chart not really sure if it's ogive or ogive but because i've heard it both ways i'm just going to call it an ogive because i like to jive um <laughs> anyways so um basically the ogive chart or um, also known as the cumulative relative frequency chart um, is basically just a graph of um, the percentiles of a set of data. Um, cumulative, remember, cumulative relative frequency is um, this like a set of data that represents like the cumulative cumulative percentages, which is essentially what percentile is. Um, so I'm gonna we'll show you an example of this um, down here just so that you can be sure to understand how that works. Um, but so here, for example, we have um, the ages of the first 44 US presidents, uh, when they were inaugurated, um, and could create a cumulative relative frequency graph, or an ogive chart. Um, and so here are your frequencies. So these are the, the actual frequency. So there were two presidents between the ages of 40 and 44. There were seven between 45 and 49, etc. So what we do to create a um, cumulative relative frequency graph um, as we make a chart with the um, cumulative relative frequency on the y-axis um, and the ages of the presidents on the x-axis. Okay, so I've at least set up my axes first. Okay, so these are the ages. I didn't label it yet, but I'll, I'll do that later. Um, and the idea is you want to have the percentiles for each set of values you have on the x-axis. So, for example, this value two, that means we have two presidents between the ages of 40 and 44. Um, and two out of the 44 presidents um, is like point, uh, is 4.5%. Then my next value, because it's cumulative, I'm including the people that I've already counted. So rather than seven out of 44, I'm actually doing seven plus two out of 44, so nine out of 44. So as you go, you keep accumulating the previous values. So 2 plus 7 is 9, and then I take that 9 and add the next 13, and I get 22 out of 44, which is 50%, um, and I keep doing a cumulative, the cumulative distribution. Um, if you are doing something like this, you should always end up at 100% by the end because you are accumulating all of the data. Um, and so then the idea is you just kind of make a line graph um, of plotting these percentages. Um, so I'm going to do 40, 44, and about 4.5%. So these are going up by 10%, so it'll be about here. So that's about what it should look like. Um, and you can, so you kind of have to think about like whether or not the distribution is skewed um, based off of an ogive graph. It's not like terribly easy to tell, but you know, with a a stronger or a higher slope, with a larger slope, um, you have a, a higher amount of data um, between the two points. And so basically, like, that would be the ch where the chunk of your data is. So this, you see, like, most of the data's, you know, between the 40s and 50s, and then it kind of, like, levels off a little bit here, um, which means the, like, the extreme values are towards the end. Um, so... It's probably kind of skewed to the right a little bit. Um, the other nice thing about the ogives is that you can actually figure out the median and Q1 and Q3 really easily, because um, this, because the median has 50% of the data below and 50% above, so you would just go over to 50% of the data, look over, and then say, oh, 50%. So the median is between 50 and 54. Um, the first quartile has 25% of the data below it, so you would go over to 25% of the data and then go down and say, okay, well, 50%, 25% of the data is below 45 to 49, so I know that Q1's in there somewhere. Um, 
and you do the same thing for Q3, and you're looking for 75%. 75% of the data is below Q3. Um, so that's kind of what they're good for. They're really useful to find um, the, the median in Q1 and Q3 from, from those graphs and also the percentiles. So another way to compare data um, is using something called the standardized test score. Um, we're going to be calling it the z-score pretty much from here on out, but you should also understand that it is a standardized score. Um, and basically what it does is it makes, like if you have two different test scores and you want to compare them and see how you did on each one compared to the rest of the um, people who took the test, you would want to look at your standardized test score because those tests might be out of different, different values so um, or different totals. So if you have X is your observation from a distribution, um, it has a known mean and standard deviation. The standardized value of x is z, which is um, x, the, or the x value, minus the mean, divided by the standard deviation. Um, and so it's, it's basically, it takes a value, and it centers, it like subtracts the mean from it, so it finds the distance between that and the mean, and then divides by the standard deviation. And so it, it gives you like a reference point to compare that to other, um, other observations maybe from a different data set that you want to compare and contrast. Um, so this example um, you would use the z-score for. So go ahead and, and give this a try and see if you can do it without me having explaining it to you. Um, and then check it, make sure you have it right. Okay, so for this problem you've got a student who's taken both the SAT and the ACT for college. Um, but she knows there are different types of tests, um, so she wasn't sure which one she'll do better on. So her plan was to send the one she did the best on to her college, um, her colleges that she was applying to. So she got a, th um, she got a 1310 on the SAT, and um, this information is also pertinent to the mean um, in 2017 when she took it. it was 1083 with standard deviation of 203. And then her ACT score was 29, um, with the average for that year being a 20.8, standard deviation of 4.5. So which test did she do better on, and which one should she send in? So for the SAT, her Z-score is X minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So that's 1310 minus 1083 divided by 203, which is 227 over 203, which is 1.1182. Now we didn't talk about what this number means in context yet. Um, but I will get to that in just a second. So you do the same thing for the ACT, um, and you find that her ACT Z-score is 1.8. So in context, the Z-score measures how many standard deviations above or below the mean the observation is. You know it's above if you get a Z-score that's positive, and below if you get a Z-score that's negative. So in this case, Abby has a score on the SAT that's 1.12 standard deviations above the mean, um, and then ACT score of 1.82 observations, uh, uh, standard deviations above the mean. So she actually did better on the ACT um, because she is doing better um, comparatively to other people who took the test um, on that one. So she should definitely send this score in. So um, when, whenever somebody asks you to interpret the Z-score, um, that's kind of where you want to go is it's how many standard deviations above or below the mean that observation is. Um, and so what's nice is it kind of gives you a standardized, hence the name, standardized value to be able to compare different tests to. Um, and also to help you compare yourself to how other people did. So um, it, you know, if your teacher gives you the mean and standard deviation of the class, you could find out how you did in comparison to everybody else um, and whether or not you should like be concerned, I suppose. <laughs> so anyways, that's that. Have a great day. I'll see you later.